There we go. Ecological biomechanics, large scale movement of. Uh, so if we look at ecology, they can tell us things about like home range size and stuff like that, how many young uh, species lives and what's a suitable habitat. And then we look at things like biomechanics, we can know a lot about an animal, how fast it can run, how high it can jump. But then there's this sort of gap in between where we don't know how that changes in different habitats or we don't know what an animal is actually doing in its environment. And so that's what we were trying to figure out with this is not only know something about the ecology, which we still need to know, something about the biomechanics, which we'll still need to know, but something more that where those two overlap, what they actually do in a ecological setting. So we've got a few people here. Everyone pretty much knows everyone else, hopefully, but maybe we could go around and everyone can have a quick say about what they do. How about start with you, Chuffa? What do you do? You even get a microphone, so yeah, yeah. try that. Hello, I'm Andrew from UQ. So, uh, I'll speak loud. My PhD was on um, soccer penalties. So I built a mathematical model um, around that. And then my supervisor, Robbie, his new idea, having worked with Chris, is we want to be able to stick accelerometers on soccer players and be able to count and quantify everything they're doing during games and training. So we can see that, you know, this kid never uses his left foot. This kid like controls the ball at the inside of his foot instead of the outside of the foot. Yeah, basically everything they do, we can quickly go, right, this is everything that that kid is doing, training games and be able to provide that data to coaches and learn from. So that's, yeah, it's but all you're just also a, collecting like performance, right? Yeah, we're like doing how successful a, a kid is. Yeah, we're also doing like tests on how well, how good they are at dribbling, how good they are at passing, their performance in games. So yeah, collecting all of this, put it all together, and see how we go. Yeah. So this is basically just, can we do this yeah. at this point in time? Perfect. Hello. Um, so I've been around for some of Chris's meetings, so I'm probably repeating myself, but I'm also working with Robbie at UQ and we're pretty much looking at um, like the predation risk of different species of bandicoots and relating that to how they use their um, habitat, their maximum performance, how fast they run, how well they corner, and then putting the accelerometers on them to see their behaviors in the wild. So does different habitat types change their running? Do they run faster and open? Do they turn better in the closed environments? Is there a difference between the populations and yeah quantifying that to their predation risk pretty much. Um, I'm Lily so I work with the British Antarctic Survey um, in the UK and I work on seabird movement and behavior um, so one of the things that you find with seabirds often is you put an immersion logger on them so you can tell when they're in the water and when they're flying but the problem with that is the two things they do on the water is like very active foraging and feeding and having a rest <laughs> so ecologically that's like a big challenge to tease apart and one of the obvious ways that you might be able to start doing that is with an accelerometer so that you can see kind of on water active time and on water resting time um, which will just make things a lot, a lot clearer when you're doing behavioral analysis when they're out at sea so that's why I'm here. <laughs> Hi guys I'm Fern I'll move out here so I can face you guys I'm still in my undergrad here at USC doing an animal ecology degree. So I'm very new to this biomechanics world, but I've recently joined Chris, uh, helping on him and Nicole's paper uh, using uh, self-organizing maps, which we're learning about today and looking at cat behavior and quantifying whether a prey protective device called the cat bib is actually changing the behavior in cats when wearing accelerometers. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about self-organizing maps today. Again, I'm very new to all of this, but it's great to meet all these new people and I'll pass it on to you, Josh. Thank you. Thank you, Fern. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Josh. I do uh, invasive ecology biomechanics is probably the title. Um, so I'm looking at the, in a similar way to Kayla, I'm looking at, uh, but from another perspective, I suppose, so how good our invasive predators are at hunting our native animals and looking at the difference uh, biomechanically and behaviorally between those two clades. 
Cool. All right, I'm Jordan. Um, I'm an honors student. I've only just started up. So um, what I'm looking into is kind of the daily lives of parentes in arid zones throughout Australia. Um, we don't really know what they're actually doing in their day-to-day -day lives and their finer scale ecology or behavioral ecology. So we're going to use the accelerometers to really work out what they're actually spending their time doing, looking at some behavior, uh, some performance-based stuff. Um, and then hoping to compare that to some lace monitor work around the Sunshine Coast and see how both those two varanids um, differ. So, yeah. Hi, I'm Jasmine. Um, I'm another one of Chris's honours students and I'm doing my honours on um, using accelerometer to figure out what are the benefits or advantages or disadvantages of gliding compared to quadrupedal locomotion in marsupials. Um, we're sort of looking at energy cost, um, how far like distance traveled, and we're also looking at um, predator avoidance and stuff like that. So how often do they come on the ground? And hopefully we'll figure out some evolutionary drivers that made marsupials glide and some didn't, um, some not, that's me. Hello, I'm Kate. Um, I completed my honours with Chris at the end of last year and what I was doing was looking at the morphological and biomechanical modifications in marine iguanas of the Galapagos to see um, what extent of modification is required for the very unique transition that they've undergone being obviously the only extent marine reptile living in both terrestrial and an aquatic environment. Um, COVID put a bit of a, a dampener on plans to go back, but I'd love to learn a little bit about accelerometers and perhaps maybe apply this to them one day, which would be super, super cool. Hello everyone, I'm Taylor. I'm um, an academic at UQ in the School of Biomedical Sciences and Chris and I have been collaborating on various projects for some time now. But um, one of the things I'm interested in using accelerometers for with Chris and Robbie, a collaboration is to um, quantify performance in the wild and, and use it to, to help validate some of the models we're building. Um, because one thing we know is that maybe, well, we have, uh, we're not quite sure how, um, lab measures of performance, things like maximum speed um, compared to these uh, more natural environments. So we're trying to um, make some comparisons between lab performance and in the wild performance and use it um, to help um, build and validate our musculoskeletal models. My name's Bob, I'm a postdoc with Chris working more on the scaling of biomechanics in Brandon's, but it'd be great to see uh, again, how relevant those measurements are ecologically. Cool. Awesome. And Lauren? Um, I'm Lauren. So I'd be potentially starting a PhD with Chris and Taylor next year, looking at the uh, biomechanics of hopping and bounding marsupials. Cool. All right. So uh, everyone's here. Everyone's got an idea and we all want to try and use these accelerometers uh, and see what they are and what they are about. So this is just a presentation of the workflow. And when I was putting it together, it struck me how long it is, <laughs> tedious it is. So I apologize, um, but we are trying to make it better and more streamlined. So any help in that regard uh, is, is really, really appreciated. A lot of people have helped us along the way, um, and I'll hopefully try and remind myself to um, mention uh, who's, who's doing what. But this is basically what we're going to go through. So there's about five steps. Um, I'm going to start off with how we collect the data. Um, then the second is how we're going to build this training data set. So, uh, and we're going to do that in MATLAB. Then out of that training data set, we've got to uh, define some classifiers. And those classifiers are the things that we're going to feed into this machine learning network. We're going to call it a SOM. So every time you hear SOM, just think artificial neural network, machine learning network. And there's tons of them out there. And SOM is just one type. And, and that's what Fern's going to talk about is why we picked this one type. And finally, we're going to get to the last bit. And this is actually the bit that I've actually got the least amount of information on because 
it took us two years to get to this bit. And it turns out we haven't actually done much of the last bit, which is where you do you some data analysis where you have all this information on behavior and you can put it into some sort of context. So uh, that bit is just going to sort of fizzle out into nothing at the end. So really sorry about that. But hopefully <laughs> we'll get through uh, the, the first few bits and then we can just sort of have a conversation about what you could use this data for at the end. So data collection. So what we're going to do in this first part is go through how I'm going to collect this machine learning data sets and some other data sets we might collect on the side, some of these biomechanical data sets and these dead reckoning data sets. And we're going to come back to them right at the end in the data analysis as to why we collected those other two data sets. Uh, so we can talk about them more at the end if, if you're interested in that. But to collect the machine learning data set, the first thing we need is, of course, something like an accelerometer. Now, there are hundreds of types of accelerometers out there. Um, I know um, uh, Kayla probably has been looking at a few different types, uh, and she's been looking at GPSs. But with accelerometers, you can have like little chips. This is what the, the accelerometer itself is actually tiny. Uh, and that kind of makes it good. Because it's so small, uh, we can actually attach it onto very small animals. Uh, but this is the, the accelerometer part, but then we need some processors, some storage, and some batteries. So that all adds up. Uh, and there are a few different types of accelerometers you can use. We're currently using this AX3 accelerometer. It weighs about 10 grams. It's pretty good. Uh, it uh, has this huge amount of memory, and it records for a really long time. So one of the big problems we had with earlier accelerometers is that they were really, really battery hungry. And it turns out the thing that causes accelerometers to chew up battery is when you collect the data on the accelerometer, it has to write it to an SD card or some um, flash memory, right? The way you write to flash memory is, is those are all a series of capacitors and you apply a charge to the memory and that flips a bit between zero and one. So you store all your data in that method. Now, if you're doing that constantly, then your battery is constantly being taxed and it's constantly draining out that battery. And so the earliest accelerometers we had, like the work we did on echidnas, lasted about two days uh, before they drained out. This one is lasting 14 days at 100 hertz. How they do that, I have no idea, but I suspect what they're doing is they're not storing all the data as it comes in. They probably store it to some sort of volatile memory, wait till they get a bunch of that data, and then write that all as a chunk. So they're only using that big battery capacity to flip those capacitors for short periods of time. Or they could be um, uh, compressing it so they could have some logic on the chip in the AX3, which compresses that into a smaller amount of data then they store that to memory. And then when you, uh, you go to read your data, it expands it out again. Not really sure. So they don't actually say what's going on. But it's really well engineered. That's why we're using them at the moment. We have another um, accelerometer, which is from this, uh, who's it from? Techno Smart. And it's smaller. It's five grams. Five. And what's the, the life of that one? 14 days at 100 hertz. So they're getting a bit better. The only trouble is these only do uh, acceleration in all three axes. So as everyone knows what acceleration is, it's like whether you're moving forwards or backwards in a particular axis. Um, so the AS6 does an extra thing where it has a gyroscope, which is rotation about each of those axes. And we'll talk about the extra um, information you can get off that. But the other thing that might be important is what you get on most chips is you'll have three. You'll have an accelerometer, a gyroscope, and a magnetometer. And a magnetometer would just say, what's the strength of the magnetic signal in each of my three axes? And so that will give you your um, heading. So what direction you're facing on a sort of global map. This will, these gyros will get you how fast are you spinning around each axis. And the accelerometers will give you 
how much you're moving in the fallback along each of these axes. I wish something like this ASX um, measured all three, but they don't at the moment. Uh, and that's a bit of a limitation. Uh, and we'll come back to this at the end is, is when we do something like dead reckoning as to why that's important. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. So you, you couldn't work out spin, but you could work out centripetal acceleration, right? So if you want to do something like cornering, then there's some acceleration that's going to be tangential to your direction of travel, right? Uh, and so you would get that, but you can't work out rotation about an axis. Exactly, that would, that would not turn up on an accelerometer, right? Uh, so that's, that's a huge limitation of these that we're missing out on, like potentially some information. Uh, and so maybe this AS6 is, is, might be the one that we would look into um, using in the future. But all this data was on AS3, so it's just got accelerometer data. But it's, it would be pretty easy to uh, duplicate this workflow using accelerometers and gyros as well. Okay, so next we've got our accelerometer, we've picked it, uh, and then we need to attach it to our animal. Uh, and this is a non-trivial step, but I haven't gone into a lot of detail because we're all, well, I guess most of us are ecologists and we know our animals really well. And this is something that uh, is sort of animal specific, that you have to figure out how to attach your device to it. With our cats, we used a cat harness and just cable tied the accelerometer. Um, onto its chest. But the important thing is with this attachment thing is that you're consistent with the attachment. So that's going to allow you to build this training data set, which is a really long, boring, tedious process. But you can use some behaviors from animal A, and you would expect they would be representative of the behavior in animal B too. So the axes that we normally think of is X. We always orientate that, so that's fore aft movement. Y is normally side to side, so lateral movement. And Z is normally up and down. Uh, it doesn't matter if those aren't exactly right on each animal, as long as you're consistent uh, with the way you attach uh, the accelerometer on all the animals, then uh, you're going to be able to use those data sets. If you have half your data set, in one orientation and half in the other, it means you have to do this process twice because you'll need to build two different training data sets. Okay, um, here is some work uh, that uh, Jazz is doing at Hidden Vale. Um, and this is Kayla's work on Bandicoot. So I stole your slide, Kayla, I apologize for this. So this is uh, another couple of ways you can attach accelerometers. So they're using their harness again. They've just shrink wrapped it this time onto a cat. Uh, onto a possum, I should say. And in order to do that, they have to knock the possums out because the possums are nasty. Kayla uh, and Josh, I think, came up with this ingenious way of attaching them to bandicoots where they cut an old sock up and cut some holes for the arms of the sock and then they just cable tied it to the sock. But, and that's fine, you'll notice they put it on the back and I think they did the same for the quolls, right? And as long as you keep the orientations consistent, then that's going to be fine. Uh, and so if you're doing it on any other animal, you just have to figure out how, how it works best. When we did the echidnas, we actually cut spines away and we glued it into, um, in among the spines as well. Okay, so that's attaching your accelerometer to the animal. The next step is filming your animal doing stuff. Uh, and so here you need um, some camera equipment. And then the higher the speed of the camera equipment, the, the easier uh, or the more detail you can capture. So when we did the cat stuff, for example, we used things like GoPros at 120 frames per second. We just filmed a whole pile of behaviors. At Hidden Veil, they have a whole pile of cameras just set up, like security cam. Um, and they're quite good too. So you can see this little possum. Uh, walking along there, so you have a timestamp uh, and um, some behavior um, that's going to be important later. And here you can see another different type of behavior, which is a climbing behavior, uh, and we have a timestamp for that behavior too, and that's going to become uh, important in a moment. Um, 
Next, we need to be able to synchronize that camera to our accelerometer. And this is uh, non-trivial. And so when we started with the echidnas, this is what I would do. I would like, uh, had my camera rolling. And so I, the, the camera itself has some sort of clock. The accelerometer has some sort of clock. I want to synchronize them. And so I would want some movement that I could define. You can see here, that's my in-out movement. Here is my side-to-side -side movement. And here is going to be my up and down movement. So I can now synchronize the accelerometer trace with the video camera. But the whole swaying thing um, was getting a little bit um, tedious uh, and you felt a bit silly. And so this is what uh, we now do. So Jasmine is just going to clap a few times with the accelerometer in her hand. And those are going to turn out to be really, really big spikes. And because they're really short, sharp spikes, that's going to make synchronizing the accelerometer trace and the video uh, camera stuff together a little bit easier, um, as you'll see in a second. Okay, the final part is um, when you're collecting this um, data, is you have to have an idea of the behaviors you want in advance. Uh, and so, for example, in the cat stuff, we had about 12 different behaviors that we were interested in. And we had to make sure we collected representatives of each of these behaviors. And we needed like replicates of each behavior, right? So these were all our behaviors. Uh, and what we would do is every person who had a cat with an accelerometer on would get a GoPro and a sheet. And then the sheet just had a spreadsheet and it had behaviors along the top. And they would write down, oh, I took, I took a video, video one, uh, and it has this behavior and this behavior. And then video two has this behavior and this behavior, video three has this behavior and this behavior, and so on. And so then you have uh, like a copy to see, okay, do I have all my behaviors uh, represented? And once all your behaviors are represented, then you have enough to build your, your training data set. Two, right? So that's how we did it in the CAT project. Jasmine is doing it slightly different. So this is the hidden bail cameras and they're continuously recording. So with the GoPros, we could start and stop each um, set of filming. So I'd say, oh, my cat is eating. I'd get out my GoPro and film the cat eating for a little bit. But because here the, the cameras are constantly recording, Jasmine has to like trim her video into to chunks. And she's using this software called BandyCut, uh, which was free, presumably, yeah. online. So uh, that seemed to work quite well. Uh, so she downloads these huge long videos, um, but a really long video is going to absolutely kill MATLAB when we get to it in like a couple of slides time. Uh, so you need your videos to be short as possible. And by having short videos, we don't run out of memory um, in MATLAB. So here she's chunked all her videos into really short little segments. Uh, this one's about two minutes long. It was pretty long. But then maybe she hates herself because she wants to sit there and watch a two minute video. Uh, sorry, Chris, I've just lost the audio. 
I can't hear anymore. It may be a problem with the microphone. It cut out with a sort of... Oh wait, I can hear that. Can you hear that now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's gonna be terrible. Okay, we're possessed now. <laughs> How about that? Yeah, echoey, but I can hear it. Yeah, you gotta mute, mute yourself. No, it's just too much of that. It's just the amount of feedback is in the Yeah. yeah. Can you hear that now, Lauren? No, this should be on, on this one. Give us a thumbs up if you can hear. Yeah, it's good and clear. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right. Woo, we're back on. Yeah, go for it.
Yeah, you could. Yeah, yeah. If you're good enough, yeah, yeah. I think you should be able to do that. Uh, it's not um, super easy, but it should be possible. So, because uh, if, if you identify, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, so it would be, it's, not, it's not as straightforward because it's not just like yeah. that like Yeah, so you have to flip the signs as well. Yeah. yeah, but it, it is fixed. It is also probably a little bit of bleeding. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's safer not to screw it up. Yeah. Okay, uh, where were we? All right, so we've now um, tagged all our behaviors and we have, so we attached our device, we turned it on, we synchronized our accelerometer with that uh, camera by doing those claps. And then we filmed all behaviors and we made sure every behavior was replicated, right? Now we have a training data set. So we can move on to uh, the next set, which might be we've, we've collected our machine learning data set, and now we might want to collect a biomechanics data set. And whether you do this or not, um, it's up to you. This might give you like some context because it gives you some bounds um, from which the behavior could occur within. So if you have things like this where you release an animal, it's a really good idea to set up a camera and get the like maximum speed while it's escaping. Or you could try and collect a, a biomechanics data set in some sort of runway where you get things like maximum speed, the stride length, the stride frequency, uh, or maybe even something like turning radius. Uh, um, I'll talk about that on the next slide. So the reason we do this is for a couple of reasons. One, we want to know um, what our animal is capable of doing. And two, it might become useful uh, in a later step where we can use this information to work out the speed that the animal is actually moving uh, in its environment. So uh, we could do something like if we knew uh, the relationship between stride length and speed or stride frequency and speed, then we can use our accelerometer, which will tell us something about stride frequency to estimate movement speeds uh, in, uh, in wild settings as well. So, and then we could also collect stuff on like something like turning radius, like we were doing here with these dogs. Um, we haven't really gotten into collecting turning radius stuff and using accelerometers to um, figure out uh, what their turn radius was would need, it would be better if we had something like a gyro. Um, so maybe if we use the AS6s, we could start getting into this. Or maybe it does work with accelerometers. We just don't know at the moment. We haven't collected that training data set yet. And finally, we might collect that dead reckoning data set. And we're going to talk about this at, at the end. But normally, um, a lot of people have done this. There's a group in the UK that uh, Rory Wilson at Swansea University does a lot of this. Uh, and they, they collect the acceleration, they collect the gyro data, and they collect the magnetometer data, and they're capable of converting this acceleration back into a velocity, and then that velocity back into a speed. Because if you integrate each step, you should able to eventually get to a position. And you can use that position to actually know how far an animal has moved. So there's the potential to do that. I'm going to talk about that right at the end because there's limitations to that method too. Um, and it's a little bit tricky uh, to figure out, but technically it is possible. Uh, if you have enough uh, data that you collect at this stage, uh, that you can get to something like a uh, position, you figure out how far it's actually moved. It's also a really good idea to combine the accelerometer with some GPS data. And then we'll talk about what you can use that GPS data for. The GPS data would have to be a separate unit. Uh, I know Kayla has been trying to figure out a nice GPS unit to use, and they're really, really tricky to, to use because they have the same issues as accelerometers, this short battery life, 
slide size because we can't touch too much on them. Um, and, and that's just something we, we still have to figure out too. So I'm not going to focus a lot on the GPS in this. Uh, it's just something to be aware of. But if you can, you definitely should include a, a GPS uh, in your data collection as well. Okay, so now we've collected all our data that we might possibly want. And now's the time that we're going to build that training data set. So we're going to go through this step in MATLAB. And the first thing we're going to do is align the video and accelerator code together manually using those definitive signals, the claps or the plays or something like that. And then we have to calculate the difference between the clocks on the um, camera and the acceleration, because there's going to be two clocks, one on the camera, one on the accelerometer, and they're going to be different because it's probably be really, really difficult to, to perfectly synchronize them. Uh, so we'll try and uh, get them to be as close as possible. We'll set the time on the camera and the time on the accelerometer to be as close as possible, but there's still going to be a little difference between them. And there might also be some difference in sampling frequency. So we have to allow for that um, when we're synchronizing them as well. Uh, then once we have aligned them, because we might only have one video where we have the claps, um, like Jasmine does, she only has one moment where she has the claps. And so we'd use those claps to align the video, but then we might have a second video with our unique behavior, which we have to then use all this information, this, this synchronized information, uh, to align that and extract only the portion of the accelerometer trace that's relevant to that particular video. And finally, once we've done that, we're going to manually tag that behavior um, and output the data. So we'll have a data frame that says accelero acceleration and X, Y, and Z axis, and what behavior that's associated with each time step. Did you ideally have a video synchronized from every single step? Because if there are power outages, you often have someone synchronized right away. Yes. Okay. So you ideally, would. you want one. You, you would want as many synchronization moments as possible but it's almost never possible when you're releasing an animal. So the best you can do is get one at the start and one at the end, right? So you get one when just before you release your animal uh, and then you'd get one when you capture it back. But there might be 14 days in between those two where you won't have anything to synchronize your video with. So in those cases, and this is something that um, we'll talk about in a second, but we use some like events. So if you're like, your animal jumps down, that's going to produce a big spike in the accelerometer signal. And you can use that to synchronize it too, because uh, these clocks are going to drift. And I'll show you an example about how quick they drift as well uh, in a second. So we're going to go through those steps now, and we're going to do it in MATLAB. And so we've built this just horrible code in MATLAB that tries to do those steps. Um, and it works, it's just not very elegant. So the, it looks like this. We have uh, an MP4 window where we would um, upload our video. And then we would have X, XR, our accelerometer trace along here. And then we'd have a behavior window down here. And the idea is we open up the accelerometer trace, we open up the video, we input the clock time for each of those, um, we calculate the differences between the clocks and any delay that we need to adjust. We then have our accelerometer trace just for that video itself. And then we can manually tag our behaviors for that accelerometer trace. So it sort of looks like this for one of the videos. This is one of the cat videos. And uh, so we've put our accelerometer trace. Normally it's much longer, um, but because we put this video in, we have two different timestamps here. We know the difference in seconds and frames. We can just um, capture that chunk of the accelerometer signal. Uh, and then we can now assign some behavior. So here you can see a jump down from where the cat's jumped down. And then it's sat still for a little bit. And then it's walked along here. So we've assigned them all these behaviors here. So, um, I've got, uh, oh, this is the last step, is we need to, so you notice we needed to know the time that each video started at. That was really um, 
crucial. If you've got those um, videos where you're chunking them yourself, so you have to know the timestamps exactly. Um, but if you've got something like a GoPro video or something like that, you can actually get some software. We found this one called Media Info, which is quite good. Uh, and that allows you to, to right click on each video and get the actual start time to the second, which uh, Windows doesn't display um, by itself. So that allows you to figure out exactly when the start time of each video is, which is going to be um, important for figuring out the, um, the um, coordination between these two. Okay, so here's the code in MATLAB. And I'm going to try and go through it um, and we'll see if it works because um, it may or may not. It will work. It yeah. will work? Okay. Because it often doesn't work, I already <laughs> loaded in the accelerometer trace. Um, so I click the open Excel. You can't actually see this. I want to minimize this. Maybe I'll move it. I'll move it down here. We don't need that. So you see this says step one, open Excel. So I just open an accelerometer trace. When I open the accelerometer trace, it gives me the time of the accelerometer trace. So it just pulls that out. This is an accelerometer trace has normally four columns. The first column is just the time, the clock time, and then X, Y, and Z, the accelerometer um, signals from that. And so I take the very first time and I, I um, display it there. So we know what accelerometer trace it is and approximately when it began. Uh, and so then it displays this along here. And so this is what an accelerometer trace just looks like, just a bunch of noise. This is actually one that Jasmine made for her dog. It was just like a test one that we made. And you'll notice these spikes here, these are all the calibration spikes. So she's put lots of calibration spikes um, in this one to make it a little bit easier for us. These little blurry bits here, that's where it's actually a dog is running, but right now we can't see anything because it's all squished together. Uh, so we need to um, zoom in on a section that's relevant uh, for this particular video. How long does that trace start and how long does it take I think that would be like nearly a couple of hours. No, 15 no? minutes. 15 minutes, yeah. So you imagine if it's 14 days, you see nothing, but like, <laughs> noise right so it's completely useless to try and load it and this is what i was talking about the longer your video is the the more compressed your accelerometer trace is going to be and so it's going to be harder and harder to distinguish behaviors um, so now we have to know something about uh, these videos so i can go into uh, here gliding this is cooper Thanks, Cooper. I think uh, Josh was kind enough to give me the cheat notes um, for these videos. Uh, and so you can see here, Josh has figured out what the day, hours, minutes, and seconds is. Um, I'm not going to bother putting in the days, but if you've got an animal that goes over multiple days, you will. I'm just going to go 10, 35, 56. So I'll input. Uh, Hours is going to be 10 minutes, 35. Uh, nothing's going in because none locks not on by default. They hate people. 35, 56. Uh, and so that's the start time for this particular video, right? Um, and this, the first one you would put in would be your calibration video. Uh, and so because our calibration is normally at the start, I might want to zoom in just at the start and try and get this calibration here so I can work out what the delay is um, between the two. So I'm just going to trim it. I can see I need to get it to there, which is probably going to be the first 2,000 samples of the accelerometer trace. And hopefully, sorry, 2-2? Uh, so then I'll check apply uh, and hit refresh and hopefully it zooms in uh, and you can see here's my uh, 
here's my calibration claps here. So that's neat. Uh, so now I want to try and figure out how well aligned my video is uh, to my accelerometer and adjust that if necessary. So this is the bit that normally uh, everything crashes. I'm going to set my frame step to be about 10. So we don't have to sit here all day, um, but let's see if it works. So there is uh, Desmond moving along and there's a little red line appearing here. Yeah, so we've got a little red line here. Uh, and that is where we are on the accelerometer trace. And we can watch Jasmine, and she's just about to clap in super slow motion. Mm -hmm. Normally it goes a lot faster than this. This one's absolutely struggling. And you can see there, that is her first clap. So that should align with this spike here, but it doesn't. They're just obviously different. No, because it's the first. Because if I watch this video, I'll see five claps. Uh, and I'll know this is the first of five claps. I've watched this video about a thousand times. <laughs> What's the stuff that's at the end? This? So what she's done, she started the accelerometer, put it on the dog, uh, and then she's uh, put the dog down, uh, and she uh, oh, that sounded terrible. <laughs> Got the dog to sit on yeah. view of the camera, uh, and then she's set up her camera, and she started filming herself. So the accelerometer trace goes for a little bit longer. Uh, but it's not on the dog. No. Yeah, no, no, no. That's just. So all that was like talking about. Yes. Well, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 So the, where the line is now, it's like that second half. That's right. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Sorry, I should have explained. Yeah. My bad. Yeah. She's got the accelerometer in her hand. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Know, the way you know it's a clap. Yeah, exactly. these spikes are, are really, really obvious, right? And the frequency should be like. Yeah, this bit here is, we'll actually get to this, but this is what the dog running looks like. Over here. It almost looks like noise. You can see yeah. her like putting it on the dog. It's yeah. A bit last quick. Yeah, that, that would be uh, Jasmine walking over, putting it on the dog. And then the dog is really well trained and just sits there uh, while yeah. Jasmine runs away and then she calls it over and the dog goes, yay, and then runs over. All right, but first I have to synchronize these. So I want to get this little red line to be lined up with this clap. Uh, and I know it's about 650 frames off. So here's 500, here's 1,000. That's about a bit over 500, right? right? And I'm obviously done this one before and I know it's about 650. So I can put in a delay of 650 here and then we hit play again and you can see now um, they, they should all line up. So here's the second clap which is coming in, uh, it's in between the gap. Line up, line up, line up, go, clap, Jason, clap, 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 boom, there we go. And then uh, we should have a third clap. And it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Boom. Right. So they all line up now. Uh, and then um, once she's done two more claps, she'll walk off. So this bit is kind of like where you have to just try different numbers in this delay until you work out what's the right one. Uh, and so now it's nicely synchronized. So how many frames can you be out of it, it doesn't matter for anything except allowing us to know what behavior is what, oh, right? Okay. So if you're out by a few frames, that's fine because you still know like walking when you, you see it walking and you know, oh, that bit there must be walking and that bit there is jumping. It's a little bit harder if you have really complex activities like a jump up and then a jump down, you might want to separate them up um, and they're really short. 
periods of time. So uh, this synchronization stage is just for visual feedback. So we can, so we can uh, map our behaviors onto it. All right, I'm gonna stop this painful process and let's skip ahead and see if it lines up with our dog. Nearly there. Nearly there. That's Jasmine walking back and the dog is still sitting. Good dog. And if we play here, I might increase it to 20, so we're not here forever. Here's our dog, and it's running along. And we see the dog spike here, right? So we see each individual footfall. Cool. Okay, so now we have aligned our video. And this one actually is a rare case because we have both the calibration and some behavior in the same video. But normally we wouldn't. We'd normally have one, one calibration video. So now I'm happy with this delay. So I would check the save delay uh, here. And so that's going to um, save it for later. Uh, so I can now use it in. And now I want to um, call in a second video, right? That would be my behavior. I could actually call in the same video again. Um, so we could try that because that's going to save us a little bit of time. So if I just put in the same time, 35 and 56, I'm going to uncheck this apply because that apply only gives me the first bit. And if I go cap time diff, that should be zero frames and zero seconds. Normally it would calculate the difference. Then if I go trim Excel, it's only given me the accelerometer trace from that video, right? As you can see, it, there wasn't a long pause before the start of the spikes. Uh, and then we had the dog running and then the video continued for a bit once the dog was off the screen. So now I could use this um, to, uh, start linking my behaviors. So I could now go, okay, I know um, it was galloping um, and I could select this region here where it was galloping. And that would now give me uh, an activation uh, vector. So each one of these behaviors here, and you can choose your own behaviors, right? Um, is assigned a number. Uh, and so these numbers go from zero to 12, in this case, but I think it might be a bit more. And so whenever I choose um, an activity, it just increases that vector to the number. So now we have uh, an extra column that we're creating. So we have our time, we have acceleration and X, Y, and Z. And now we have an activity vector, which is basically some numbers between one and the number of behaviors we have, like 12. And so if I export that, then I'll just get those five columns um, coming out uh, just, just for this um, trace, right? We can try um, a different video um, and see if this works. So I'm gonna try Cooper Fast uh, and see how well this works. So MATLAB is going to struggle for a little bit um, because it's trying to display it on this massive screen here. So I'll have to be pretty patient. Is there um, a Z button? Uh, that's where well, you can just overwrite it, right? So if you guys select and you select over this with a different behavior, it'll just change whatever that thing was. You can also unselect that checkbox and then just do it and select over that behavior and go back to the That's it? Yeah. Huh. I didn't know that. No, so if I go, if I uncheck galloping yeah. and then go select, that should make everything zero again. Is that right? Zero. No. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. But if I did like walking, oh, it did work. Look at that. 
divided walking, and now I, I think walking is here. It's there. Okay, it took a while to refresh because now what happened is I loaded in a new video. It goes back to the entire accelerometer trace because it doesn't know where in the accelerometer trace this new video is. But we do know what the delay is. We do know the sampling uh, frequency of the video that it's automatically figured out. And we know the accelerometer rate, that's automatically figured out. Uh, I should mention a few things at this time though. So here the video rate is 119.881. Now that's because the clocks in the camera, the GoPros, aren't perfect, right? It's trying to take a frame every 120th of a second. But it doesn't always do that because there's some quartz oscillating crystal in there that just well, is supposed to oscillate at some frequency, but it doesn't do it quite right. Um, so we get an average frame rate over the entire video. And the average frame rate ends up being 119.881. It's the same for the accelerometer too, right? So the accelerometer has a clock in it. The clock is not perfect. Uh, and the clock, is trying to take an accelerometer sample every 1 50th of a second, and I was trying to take 50 a second, but sometimes it does a good job, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the time between two samples is slightly longer than the time at other moments, right? So we end up with an average accelerometer rate of 48.4128 seconds. That's an issue. It's a huge issue. The reason it's an issue is this number actually varies a little bit throughout the trace. And it's going to vary more and more uh, as time goes on. It's one of the big limitations of accelerometers is the fact that the clock drifts. And if we're trying to synchronize things, uh, that clock drifting is going to put this delay that we calculated with our um, signal, it's going to start to, to put it out a little bit. And you'll see it here. So now with this Cooper Fast, um, I think Cooper Fast is um, it's 10, 40, 28. Is that right? Yeah. So we already got the timestamp for this one. So that was 10, 40, 28, did I say? 28. So we're going to calculate the time difference. And they're about 272 seconds apart, or about 13,168 frames apart. Uh, so now it knows how far apart the, um, the, this video is from the other video. And so it's going to try now, select a portion of this accelerometer trace that's relevant for this video compared to that first video. So we only align the first video. And now I'm going to try and say, okay, take your best guess at where you think um, this video is on the accelerometer trace. And we see this. So again, it looks similar, but it's slightly different, right? So this is the second video. But Jasmine does the same thing in this. She does that claps again. And then the dog's going to do a run. It's actually a faster run. And you can tell it's a faster run because these spikes are faster. They're higher, right? The amplitude is greater. They're about, they go between minus six and six Gs. That's actually something else I forgot to mention is that you get to pick your, the rating of your accelerometers, whether you want um, to have these G forces be really high or, or really low. And there's a trade off if I pick like 14 plus or minus 14 Gs, I'm going to pick up these spikes, but then I'm going to get less resolution, right? If I pick a lower rating, say between plus or minus two Gs, I'm going to get really good resolution between that, but it's going to miss out on all these spikes. So you have to sort of know, um, well, um, have a look at how many Gs you think your animal is going to produce. So a big dog, about six Gs, Smaller animal is going to be slightly less. A bigger animal is going to be slightly more. Okay, 
Now we have to see how well these traces line up. Uh, so, oh my God, I'm making a mess. I'm going to fast forward it. It is normally a lot smoother. It's just this, um, this computer is not handling MATLAB and PowerPoint being open and everything at the same time. Okay. So, oh, did we already miss a clap? Yeah. yeah. So if I play it backwards, there's a clap there that we should be on. So there should be a clap here. Uh, and you can see it's about now 50 frames out. So I've got to adjust my delay to be 50 frames. And that's a big change. Normally it's not that bad. Uh, but there's a, is that our first clap? Oh, I'm a bit out still, aren't I? 45? Let's see this one. Those claps. Oh, I'm out by like a little bit, maybe 40. Um, <laughs> you wrote like five or something. Uh, no. And there. Yeah, so that's the last clap. And Jasmine walks off. So we're seeing Jasmine's. Accelerometer trace as she's walking here. She'll attach it to the dog. And at some point, the dog will bound into view. So we can actually see the dog starts running here. So we don't see it yet. There goes the tennis ball. And now our dog is coming through. <laughs> These green spikes actually synchronize with when the front limbs hit the ground. That's because the accelerometer is sitting on its uh, collar. Uh, so it's gonna be better associated with them. Okay, so if I was interested in this behavior, I would then select this region here, here to here, and I'd say that's galloping. And now I could export that entire um, segment uh, from uh, zero to the end. Uh, and it would give me the, um, those traces. Um, but I don't have to export the whole thing because here I've got a whole pile of unknown stuff that I don't actually need. So I can pick when I want to start or end. And maybe I want to end it there. And maybe I want to start it. Oh, that's too far. I should make that little red line bigger. So I'll start it about there. And so when we export this, I should see a bunch of zeros, then a bunch of some number, maybe 14, and then a bunch of zeros again at the end. Uh, and I just have to make sure I haven't exported something with a similar name. Nope, looks like we're okay. Oh, it's going to be here, isn't it? Oh, there's the one. I'm going to delete that. Uh, date modified. There's nothing there. So if I export, there's no errors. It'll work. It looks like it might have. I don't know what that area is, but let's have a look here. Date modified. There is a GoPro. Uh, so it names it with the, the label of the video and Excel app. And then we open it up. We see a bunch of zeros and then behavior 12. And then it goes back to a bunch of zeros at the bottom. So we've now just exported that segment and we have some behaviors. Um, so we have time, X, Y, and Z, and our behavior, right? So it's looking good. This time is some crazy time format that MATLAB has, but it's, there's just a line that converts that into actual time as well. 
Um, and that's pretty standard um, in that code. All right. Do you have to um, have a number? Is it only for the visualization purposes of that bottom of the graph, or is that number? Like, could you have a um, a letter, for example? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. that's just to to show the nice depth. The, the yeah, because if you had a letter, then would you wouldn't be able to okay. graph it yeah. as easily, right? Yeah. So the numbers just make it easier yeah, to graph. Okay. Yeah, they're just for that visualization. Um, so yeah, if we were to go back here and say um, export this as walking, then we could have two different behaviors in between yeah. and we would yeah. see it. Right. Cool. Okay. So do you have a random swap? Hmm. You can have whatever behavior you want, right? So you'd have to define a behavior that's jumped in. Yeah, so I think there was one Nicole had, for example, that was bite and hold, uh, which is where cats, you know how they sometimes pounce on something and they like grab it and kick it. Uh, so you can define the behaviors however you want, but you can't define two behaviors at once. I think that's your question, right? Um, okay, so back to PowerPoint. Uh, <laughs> oh, my life sucks. <laughs> All right. I have to go shift F5. Have we done that? We've done that. We're over here. All right. So we've defined, so we've um, now labeled our data. So we've got it into that format uh, that we like. It looked like this, right? Where we had, we had time, we had X, Y, and Z. And we had some activity which was labeled. So now we have to build, uh, define some classifiers. So there's a step that I don't show you, uh, which is we gather all those Excel, fi Excel files together, the ones that Matt uh, poops out. You have to put them all together and then you just append them into one giant um, file. So you just have those five columns. And then each behavior can just be appended onto the one below it because it doesn't matter what order they're in um, because the next code is going to go through it line by line anyway. Uh, and then we're going to define. So what we're going to look at now is we're going to we've grouped all our data together. Now we're going to define some classifiers because right now we only have three things. We've got X, Y, and Z. We need a lot more classifiers than that. Um, and luckily there's a paper that we're going to go through that taught us how to do them. And then we're going to apply them in a rolling epoch. And I'll explain what that means in a second. Then we're going to output the data uh, with the most suitable behavior for each particular epoch. So uh, we've got our data. It's in this format, a crazy MATLAB format, acceleration and then some activity. Uh, now we want to define our classifier. So what I mean by a classifier is, is, is a way of summarizing all that acceleration data because that acceleration data is just, there's only three variables and we want to build a huge number, right? How many though? Turns out no one really knew. Um, this one paper looked at it and actually looked at it in Dingoes. So they tested a whole pile of different predictor sets um, with machine learning algorithms. And the first predictor said they just took those X, Y, and Z values, the three axes, X, Y, and Z, and they fed that into a machine learning algorithm. And then they built another data, predicted data set where they took that, they had another one, which is SMA, signal magnitude, signal um, magnitude amplitude, but they just summed those three together. Um, WL, which is, I think, um, a frequency analysis. DBA, some other thing, overall dynamic body acceleration, uh, vectorial dynamic body acceleration and Q, I forget what that was, they defined it in the paper. Then they, and so on and so on. So they were building these different ways of summarizing. You see in this one, they got the mean of the Z, uh, X, Y, and Z. They got the minimum and the maximum, the standard deviation. They got the correlations between like X and Y, Y and Z, um, X and Z and so forth, the skewedness, the ketosis, uh, that signal magnitude again, 
They even went super crazy uh, and they defined in this one 69 different classifiers, like from absolutes to means to min to maxes, the differences along those, um, some standard deviation, a whole pile of statistical ways of representing those three data sets. So they went through them. Anyway, that they could imagine of taking three vectors, x, y, and z, and compress, uh, compressing them into a different number of predicted variables, anywhere between three um, and 69, right? Then they tested them with a machine learning script, uh, a bunch of different machine learning scripts, and they looked at the precision, sensitivity, and specificity uh, of those, and we'll talk about what those mean in a second. And what they found was the number of predictors were best in their sets um, eight and four. Those were the two that kept coming out to be the best predictor sets. So let's have a look at what eight and four are. So four was, it just had the axes, the mean, the min, the max, the standard deviation, the correlation, skewedness and ketosis, uh, or the one that was only slightly better had a huge pile. So this had only 26 variables. This one had 53. Uh, but either of these seemed to be work pretty well. So these were equally as good. And this one has a bit more information. For example, it's got these overall dynamic body accelerations, which you might be interested in itself because that's been correlated with energetics of movement. Same with this vectorial dynamic body accelerations. Um, and the signal magnitude accelerator, you can correlate all these uh, with metabolic rates. Uh, so we decided to build a data set based uh, on these classifiers based on these. Um, and I'll show you an example of the R code uh, that we used now. See if this is actually going to work. I'm not going to run through the code, I'll just walk through the code. Uh, so this one. Try and zoom in. <coughs> oh, why don't you let me zoom? Can you guys read that okay? Yeah. Okay, so we start off. Um, we loaded this library in moments. I forget what they did. They probably did one of the um, statistical tests. Um, we define our working directory, and our working directory in this case has a whole pile of those accelerometer traces in them, right? So all the ones that MATLAB was picking out, uh, and I just collected them all in a variable called file names. Uh, and then I built an empty data frame that just has those classifiers that I'm going to create. So you can see um, I'm just building an empty data frame here. And then uh, it just runs through in a giant for loop. So it takes every file that MATLAB put out, um, reads it in, uh, and then it starts what we call this rolling epoch. So it starts at, that's what ST means, start and finish. So it starts at one and finishes at 50. So it takes the first 50 lines of that file and it applies this um, this while loop um, to that over and over again. So while that is that the finish point is less than the number of rows in that file, it's going to keep running through this part, this loop. So it's just making a window and it's going to push that window along because at the end of this, I'm going to increment that window by one. So I'm going to shift it along by one row. So we're going to just chunk down that row in a, in a 50 um, row wide um, window. And in that window, we're going to define all our um, predictors. So we get the mean, the max, the min, the standard deviation, that signal magnitude, the overall dynamic body acceleration. Um, and then of those, I get the min and max the min and max, um, I get the correlation between X and Y, the skewedness and the ketosis. Uh, and then we get the time. Uh, so I get the start time of that window. 
Uh, and this is that stupid format. Uh, this is what you have to do to convert that format into some reasonable looking <laughs> time vector. Um, it's this uh, IXCT thing. Maybe that's what that moment does. That makes a lot more sense. Um, then we get that activity sample. And because we've got that 50 um, row wide window, it might have multiple activities represented in that window. So I get whichever activity is most common in that window, right? But you'll also notice this is a nice way of bulking up our data set. Because if you have an activity that goes for, say, 100 frames, out of that, you're going to get nearly 50 um, data points back out of it, right? Because your window can fit in 50 times approximately into a 100 um, frame long. Um, a chunk of data. It outputs this all into a frame and then it just binds that all to a big data set. Uh, and so uh, that's going to just um, output our process data uh, into a big CSV format. Uh, so that, that bit was quite easy. And we're going to get out something that looks more or less like this. So we have what go, what file it came from, the time that that rolling epoch started at, uh, and then all our variables. And this is going to go on for the 26 or whatever, right? So now we have all our variables. And at the end, it's going to give me whatever activity that coded for. So this is now in a really nice format to be used for machine learning. So now we have our activity, we have a bunch of predictive variables that we can feed into our machine learning network. And then we also have a, a timestamp, which might be interesting um, later as well. Okay, so we now combine all this output from this R code into one big complete data set. And that's what's going to go into our SOM, our machine learning um, network. And that is what we're going to cover in the next stage. There we go. Uh, so now we've put all our ep epoch data into a single data set. And I'm going to go through the next chunk of code, which is going to be reading it into R, we do a little bit of cleaning. Um, then we're going to build um, some functions to apply that SOM. We're going to visualize the data set. And we're going to do a couple of analyses. We're going to explore the sample size effect and explore some um, treatment effects too. Uh, but first, I'm going to stop talking for a second and let some uh, so let, <laughs> let some explain what fern is and why fern is important for uh, machine learning. So fern's been pretty good at, at figuring this stuff out. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll click forward for you. So, yeah. No, it's just going through this laptop here now. All right, cool. All right, so like uh, Chris mentioned earlier, self-organizing maps are a type of artificial neural network, which are essentially a really uh, loosely based on the animal brain um, neurological, I guess, algorithm. Self-organizing maps or SOMs, as we're going to keep referring to them as, are really good for high-dimensional data visualization and feature detection. They're really, really good for huge data sets. So, for example, accelerometer data sets, which can just become massive. They can be hundreds of thousands of points huge or even millions of points huge. And what they do is they're really, really good at just condensing them down and turning them into a really simple 2D map output. And this is kind of complicated, but I'll show you an output that we made um, that Chris will explain later on as well. They can be trained uh, as both a supervised or an unsupervised model. So what we're going to be talking about today is supervised models. And that's when you put a labeled data set into the algorithm. It will spit out a key, and then you can see what data is more similar on the map according to the key that you've made. Uh, where unsupervised is where you put the data in, and the algorithm will actually sort it out itself and spit out a whole bunch of unlabeled data uh, that it determines uh, with its own pattern. Mm -hmm. That's one? Yeah. All right. 
Uh, I was going to chat about this, but it gets very complicated. So I'll be very, I, very I put quick. it in there because I wanted to. You want to hear? I want to hear it. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm going to explain this the best I can because I don't even fully understand it myself. No, neither do I. Good. <laughs> that makes me feel better about it. <laughs> so essentially, you've got your input layer, and this is all of your labeled data in our situation. Uh, and what's going to happen is here in this section, or this weights matrix, uh, your input layer is going to randomly select a neuron from each input. I'm pretty sure this is how it works. What it's going to do is it's going to weigh it up amongst the rest of your data. And the data that is closest, or there's a formula called the Euclidean distance, uh, that gets calculated and the random neuron that gets pulled out, measure that against the rest of the data set. And the smallest Euclidean distance to that random neuron that gets pulled out will then get moved onto this 2D output feature, which is the map. And then that will happen through your entire input layer. And what's going to happen up here is those random um, neurons that get pulled out they're going to get put up here and then clustered with the other neurons that are closest to it. And that's like Euclidean distance formula. They'll cluster together. And that's how you can start seeing on the map when it's um, output, which data points are more similar and more dissimilar. And I'll show you that when we move on to another output later. Um, here, when I say only weight vectors of winner and neighbor units are updated and displayed, there's an actual competition kind of thing going on in here where they actually compete against each other to become the random neuron that gets pulled out. Um, and I wish I could explain that in more detail, but I, I just can't. I'm sorry, guys. We'll <laughs> try and learn a bit more about it as we go along. All right. So there are other models like Chris mentioned as well. So not just self-organizing maps. There's lots of artificial neural networks and lots of other machine learning networks out there. Um, I've picked these two examples from two papers that actually compare different models using accelerometer data. This paper by Tatla that was mentioned earlier uses Dingoes, and this one uses Griffin vultures and looks at behavioral modes. Each of them compare their data uh, across the different machine learning models. And I want to see which ones have the best overall accuracy of each behavior that get pulled out. And in both uh, papers, they both found that random forest models, being fed by the RFP, were actually the best overall. I think in the Tatla paper, random forest models came out to be 87% overall accurate. And here, this one's closer to 91%. Remember those numbers, 87 and 90. Yeah. So they seem high, but I'll, I'll show you another one that's higher on the next slide. Uh, and the rest of them here, again, another one that's really popular, pops up a lot, is the support vector machine, because um, that one's in this one here again. It performs better in this paper, though, than this paper. Here it comes in second, and I think here this actually comes in last. Uh, but there's a lot of them out there, and they all do really good jobs at computing high dimensional data. But however, they don't all visualize the data equally. And that's why we think SOMs are actually better. So in this case, this is actually the output from the data that Nicole and Chris were working on, and I'm helping them to write the paper on. Um, this is their output with the cat data. Uh, and here, this is the visuals of what comes out of the support vector machine and a random forest model as well. We think that SOMs are better overall because visually, they're just easier to interpret. When you look at these two, they are great models and they put out some great visuals, but we just think SOMs, when you look at them, it's very, very simple. Here, what's going on on the 2D output is you can see the key, which is the label data we've put in. And you can see by where each of these uh, label data colors are put around the map, which activities are more similar to another. And what's going on here is you can basically see that watching and walking being clustered so far up in the top left are determined to be more similar. Whereas further away, if you look down here at eating and even this one's lying, this is determining that they're more dissimilar. And so the further apart, the more different they are, the closer together, the, um, the more similar they are, basically. Also, when you see a full triangle, this is where the sum is saying it has determined it with a 100% overall accuracy. Whereas when you can see these little sort of clusters of strange different colors, that's when there was either a, a uh, false positive or a true negative happened where it's not been able to classify it um, 100%. So it's sort of just chucked in what it thinks it was. Um, so there's a couple of those in here. Also, a really good reason to have a really large data set when using SOMs is because the larger your sample size, the better it's going to uh, predict that behavior. What we had in, in this output here in this data set was that watching and walking were of our largest sample sizes. 
and it's very obvious on the map because they're clustered very much together. They're not confused amongst any other areas. And we have a very large sample of them in the corners, whereas we had a very low sample size for things like galloping, and we also had counting pretty low, uh, and it doesn't determine them very well. So you can see here that sometimes they come out 100%, not 100% accurately. Thumbs are also really, really good at visualizing which variables influence where our different data points come out on the map. So these are actually called component planes. And on that massive Excel spreadsheet that Chris just had up before with all the variables, this is actually a couple of them here. And they're actually heat mapped to show how each variable influences what comes out in the map. So for example, here, the sum of VDBA, extremely influential on this hexagon, which again is one of the ones that wasn't 100% um, accurately identified. So it's interesting that you can pull that out. And it's a really efficient way of just looking at the visual and going, okay, we know that the sum of VDBA was influential here. We know the mean of X was influential up here when it comes to watching and walking. Um, and it's just a really easy way of interpreting lots of data. I'm going to let Chris continue on. Oh, well, yeah. That was so nice to get. Um, <laughs> does that mean that um, the, the heat maps are sort of like the mechanism for what makes those? That's really cool. We think so. Yeah. And you can also use this as a way to pick which of those classifiers is important. For example, these two are kind of similar, right? So um, it's not overly useful having them both in because they're both coding for the same thing. These two are very dissimilar. So these are very useful because these are going to distinguish our activities. This one here codes for these behaviors. This one here codes for those behaviors. So you want classifiers that are going to code for a whole pile of different behaviors. So you could go through and put all these out. And if you have too many that are the same, you might remove those classifiers and add in some other classifiers that might help you pull apart your um, behavior data. And so that's why we think this SOMS is so useful, because not only do you get to see, um, oh, I now know um, that this is a really high, um, high input activity, so it tells me which, which activities are really um, going to have big spikes um, on the acceler accelerometer curve. But I can also now go, okay, which variables are best at differentiating different behaviors? Yeah. So, like, so the two, the, that bottom left square on the BDBA and the max B one, the red one, yeah. up higher on the max B, the one on up. Oh, yeah. Does yeah. so that then correlate to the one that you said it kind of keeps its shit, shit on the map? This one here, so yeah. How do you, what's happening there? That's so, galloping. So it's really good at telling me that behavior associated with samples. Yeah, but it does get it confused. So I don't know if you can see this tiny little other, other little triangles. Yeah. So we think, we're not exactly sure, but the size of the triangle tells us something about its something. So the size. Or is that the sample size? I think <laughs> it's to do with, I think when you look at how like strongly certain things cluster, that indicates sample size strength. So here we had huge sample sizes. These are really strongly clustered. These black lines are also important, by the way, because they actually show, uh, again, so they sort of show which behaviors are closer together. And they might be close together here, but these are separating, walking, uh, watching, and walking. So the black line is to separate the behavior, but also indicate that it's similar. Um, and yeah, with these triangles, if it's a full triangle and it's one color, it's supposed to indicate a 100% overall accuracy uh, or prediction where when we start getting these strange little sort of clusters of triangles, it's not sure. Sometimes it comes up with a false positive and it kind of just goes, oh, I'm not sure. And that is always indicative, it seems to be, of the behaviors of really small sample sizes. So in this data set, uh, I think it was 20,000 samples was when it was most accurate, where when it fell below 3,500 samples, uh, you started to get sensitivity and precision that kind of just didn't quite read very well. And that's what's being displayed here, we believe. Is the direction, are they eigenvectors or something? Yeah, so we're not 100% certain <laughs> what the direction means yet. Uh, so we're still researching this ourselves. Are we think they're linked to um, the classifiers? Are they? they're linked, yeah. 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 So yeah. for example, yeah. if they're all pointing in this direction, that means that something is weighing over, I don't know. Did the tag no, they didn't, they didn't look at this um, machine learning network. 
I didn't look at several of the maps. Oh, we we kind of find the cost. Yeah, yeah. They looked at different models as well. So I didn't come across almost any papers, well, at least with um, looking at classifying behaviours that tried to um, compare SOMs to other machine learning algorithms. Like none of them look at them. It's yeah, most use that random flow. Lots that of them do, and support yeah. vector. And support vector. Yeah, yeah. But we we kind of accidentally sampled across these, didn't we? Yeah. We kind of just plugged in some weird code and they popped up. And we were like, oh, cool. It, it makes me think as you build up these data sets on the various projects, like it deserves an unacting Right. Well, that's what we're writing yeah. right now. Yeah. yeah. I think so. I think so. Yeah. Cool. All, All right. right. Thanks. That's all right. Cool. Okay. Um, so, songs. Um, that's our justification for using songs. They make these pretty images and they separate the data out really, really well. So, that's what I'm going to go through uh, now. So, we've grouped all our data. I'm going to read it into R, clean it. Build a, a SOMS, which is actually easier than you think. And then we're going to go through visualize, visualizing the output here as well. Now, to do this, um, I decided to try and make an R markup, markdown um, uh, thing so we can share this with everyone uh, and um, try and explain the code a bit more. Turns out, Building these is a major pain in the ass. Uh, and what ends up happening is that it just gives you all your warning messages and doesn't always display all of these. Uh, so it drove me freaking nuts. But here is, here is my first attempt at uh, Markdown. Uh, so this is, this is the code that we have. And I, I can go through the actual code we use, uh, but my code is atrocious anyway. So we're using this co Cohonen. Cohonen? Cohonen. Uh, this is the library that the SOMS comes from, this Cohonen library. Uh, so first we set the working directory um, and we read in our data and prepare the SOMS. So now I've read in all that data with the, um, all the activities. Um, I've got some cats. This is my cat data. And they have bibs too, so um, I just have to make sure they're all different levels. Now, remember, because those um, the, uh, activities were all numerically coded, I now read in um, a file that converts those numerical codes to actual factors, right? Which is what these, these lines are doing here. They're just reading in. This CSV basically says one is walking, two is biting, three is etc. Uh, and I just append that onto my data set. So now instead of having numbers, I actually have um, some activities. Um, just clean it up a little bit. I make sure my activities are factors and the bib is a factor too. And then I just wanted to count how many of each activity I have. And you can see some we have a lot and some we have a little. So here is the table. Um, of um, activities and biting we actually have a lot, eating we have a lot, but galloping we don't have many. We only got 517 like examples of that. And those are from the rolling epochs too. So probably we had very few gallops, right? Um, and that's probably why it comes out as less, um, uh, less, less accurate in our SOMs. Grooming, we have heaps. Lying, we have heaps. Um, sitting, we have heaps, and so forth. Uh, and in this case, it's separated into um, bib off and bib on um, for our data set as well. Um, so that's just looking at our data. It's all in there. Now, what I want to do is actually, I built a little function that just helps me out. So this function is called, uh, oh, good. So here is um, just a sampling function. So in this data set, I wanted to just take a random sample of some number of rows. So I built like a little function that would just take some number of rows randomly from um, our data set uh, and then um, build them into a, um, an output that's a, that um, this SOMS likes to see, like this list. Uh, so that's what this little training, train sampling 
um, function does here. And I wanted to filter by div off or div on. Um, that's probably just specific to mine. So now we're going to build the self organizing map. And I'm going to start by getting a random sample of, of 20,000 rows. So I'm only going to take 20,000 rows. I have about, uh, in this data set, about 180,000 rows. So I'm only taking a small chunk of that data set. And this is because I want to, try to test the data set too. So I can't use it all because I can't test it on the same data that I train it on, right? So this is going to be my training data set is only going to be like a tenth of my actual data set. So the first thing I'm going to do is take a sample of 20,000 um, rows. So I'm going to get a random sample. Uh, I'm going to give you some error for whatever reason. Uh, and then I'm going to feed that random sample, which I call in, into my function. So it's going to return me um, uh, a random sample of 20,000 rows from that original data set. Right? That's going to be my training data set. So that's what I call it PR that training data set. Then I want to test that training data set. So I made a testing that, which is basically everything that's left over. So minus in. So all the rows that weren't in in, which is just a random sample of my rows, uh, is going to be in my testing data set. And here's the line for the SOM. And it's quite easy. So I just put my training data set in there and define the grid size. Uh, and then that takes a few seconds and then I plot it. And so here's the plots that come out. And here's that one that we've seen before. So it just um, outputs this plot. And we can see uh, how the, the behaviors get separated. So uh, that seems to be quite nice. We already talked about this plot a bit. Um, and how it groups these similar activities together, and the arrow sizes indicate how often uh, um, a particular behavior is represented by that element. So these elements are defined by us in this SOM here. So you can see I set a SOM grid of seven by seven hexagonal elements, right? How did I come up to that? So, how many elements to add was not super trivial, but we looked it up. It's based on the idea that we want about four to five elements per behavior. So you saw in that map, we want each behavior to have about four or five different little hexagons that represent it. Now we had 12 activities, so we needed 12 by say four, which is 48. If we keep it smaller, we get faster computations. Uh, so I wanted something around 48, but it turns out it's really nice to have your SOM as symmetrical as possible. Uh, and so we decided on the 7 by 7, which is 49, which is how I got to that 7 by 7 grid. So you might alter this code a little bit, um, depending on how many behaviors you have. The more behaviors, the bigger your grid size has to be, fewer behaviors it doesn't have to be as big. Uh, No, so I randomly chose those 20. I'm not exactly sure. No, no. Yeah. Yeah, you, you randomly chose them. But when you say you want five elements per behavior. Yeah, so that's it's ideally what I would like. It doesn't always give me that. Yeah. So, so for example, here like it's seven. given me like seven for walking, but only one for jumping. Yeah, so that's seven different times where it thinks walking happens. Seven right. different hexagons that um, seem to explain walking, watching well, right? So there's that weird support neural network where they go and define um, these things together that we don't really quite understand well. Each of those like sort of competes to be the best at defining a particular behavior. 
Uh, and the more that behavior is, the more of them that can exist to compete for it. So they separate this watching behavior out into slightly different ways of watching, right? If that makes sense. Uh, but with jumping, we only have so few that um, they all converge on this one. There's only one neuron that's really good at um, defining jumping. I'd rather they were all, there was like more that define jumping, but I just don't have enough jumping data in my data set to, to support multiple neurons because they get outcompeted by the ones that are more numerous. That's that's one way to interpret it. Yeah, that it's it's really easy to define. Yeah, or it could be that we have so few um, samples for it that there is only it only needs one neuron to explain it because there's not much variance. Because you can imagine, as we increase the number of samples, the deviation in that set is going to increase, right? Which is why the ones that get the most elements tend to be the um, the activities that are the most common as well. So presumably you could have one behavior that you get a lot of data for, a huge amount of noise in it, or another behavior that gets far less data, but there's not very much noise, and those could look very similar on that. Um, yeah, spectrum. yeah. We well, think. What's in the number of them you say might be the number of them? Yeah, so that's, we're not exactly sure what's going on, but there are these magical neurons in the network that compete, right? And they compete to contribute to an element, right? And uh, each of these elements is, I think, is this right? The output of multiple neurons. And the neurons all compete to try and make that their element as well. So there's Somewhere in that wave matrix in that you know, layer out, something goes on where there is a formula that measures the distance between one uh, one neuron and another, and the shorter the distance, the closer it will map it on the output. So um, that's the best I can And explain. I think yeah. that the history, yeah. like the background is it's based on artificial intelligence in yeah. your brain. If you have two neurons that are closer to each other, they're more likely to have a synapse and connect than if they're further apart. So I think it yeah. applies to everything to and then the synonym is just a neuron, but there's obviously no but they're very complex and we don't know everything about what's going on here, right? We can only interpret it as best we could. Yeah, I'm not even sure what that is. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think that correlates to the, the pretty picture one that you did with all the dark, like the dark blue and that one red spot. Ah, so you can see that our dark red spot now, red now red. this is really important. No two neuro, no two SOMs outputs look the same. So yeah. if you look at this one and compare it to uh, the one that we had here, they're actually going to have a different pattern. So the every time we run that SOMs function, we get a different, slightly different looking pattern here. Even with the same point down in there. Not sure about that because the way we run it, you always pick a new random set. But what we do is we run it many, many times. So we'll run this SOMS like thousands of times to get some estimate of, of accuracy. Okay, so that's the next part is um, how accurate is it? So we can test how accurate this SOM is by comparing it to the remaining data, that test data. Now, this is the reason I didn't uh, run this in R because this takes a really long time um, to, to learn. So we're gonna use this predict function and we're gonna point it to this test data. So I've just put it in a system time wrapper, but this is the line of code here. It's this predict, the SOM, the SOM was the output here of the super sum function. Uh, so it's really only two lines of code, right? And then I put the test data as my new DAC. And you can see it took 12 and a half seconds for one sum to run through that data set, right? And then once we have that, we can begin building the confusion matrix. If you're not sure what a confusion <laughs> matrix is, we have to look it up. But it's, it's what you think it should be, right? 
So here is the confusion matrix for that song. So this is our, um, our actuals versus our predicted. And what we would like to see is the diagonal have all the big numbers, because that's where it predicted the right one. Uh, and so these numbers here um, in the columns, this is where it predicted byte hole, but it was actually live. Right, so it should have predicted by hole. And then these ones here is where it was, oh, there was no case there. Um, so say so this case here, it should have predicted um, line, but it predicted the city. So you can see there's two possible ways it could go wrong. It could predict an activity um, that's that's not correct. No, I, I, I'm trying to think of what's the false positive. Yeah. So there's <laughs> false positives, true positives, false negatives. And, um, so we use this confusion matrix to, to calculate that. Uh, and so this is uh, when we get to measuring accuracy. It turns out there's multiple ways to measure accuracy. Uh, and this we actually got absolutely blasted in our review for not defining these. So here is, uh, and we didn't actually know these existed, but apparently they're big in the machine learning world. Uh, so here is the four biggest ones. There's more than this, but these are the ones that most uh, machine learning papers um, present. So sensitivity is how often the behavior is correctly identified. Uh, precision is how often the model is right when it predicts a behavior. How often the absence of a behavior is correctly identified by a model. Or uh, accuracy is more like an overall accuracy. Um, how often uh, the model is right. So we have our true positives, which are the diagonal of that table. So these are the ones that it's, it's correctly predicted it, right? Then we have our false positives, which is the row sums. So this is how often it thinks it's um, predicted a behavior, um, but it's got it wrong, right? Um, then we have our false negatives, which is when it didn't predict a behavior, but it should have. And then our true negatives are when it didn't predict the behavior and it shouldn't do it. Does that make sense? Wow, you guys are smarter than me. It took me fucking ages to get my head around that. <laughs> anyway, here's the code to produce those. And so here are our four things. How often a behavior is correctly identified. So it's going to be our true positives um, divided by the sum of our true positives and false negatives. Uh, then we have our precision, our true positives, divided by our true positives plus our false positives. So this is when we accidentally predict it, but it's not the case. Specificity is our true negatives. So here we're predicting the absence of a behavior. Our true negatives divided by our true negatives plus false positives, when we accidentally do predict the behavior, but it wasn't meant to be there. And then accuracy, which is true positives and true negatives. Those are the things we want divided by everything else. <laughs> uh, and then we can output them to a data set. Now, what's the first thing you notice here? These numbers are high, guys. Really, really high. Look at these. These are ones. <laughs> That's great. All of them are 0.99. We have a couple that are bad. Galloping. You notice that galloping came out really, really bad. But all the numbers are really, really high. And this kept coming up time and time again. This SOM seems to work really, really well for behavior data. Uh, and um, we're, we're really quite surprised at how accurate it was and how good. There was a, the only times it doesn't work is when we have very few data sets. So our jumping data set and our galloping data set, we had so few samples, uh, but the ones that we had a lot of samples for um, really high accuracy across, across the board. All right, 
So let's go back to visualizing. Uh, so this first visualization type is actually called type codes. Um, and so that's where we um, have a look at this um, map here. I can actually make these hexagons because they look nice by making the shape look great. We can also do something where we um, do this hierarchical clustering. Now this hierarchical clustering is kind of like what we would get if we left uh, the algorithm unsupervised. So this is the clusters that the machine thinks they should be. And what we would hope to see is both clusters agree. What we know of is the correct activity should also be where the clusters are that the machine predicts. Uh, and sometimes it's true, for example, this behavior, both we um, give it the correct values and it predicts all those should be clustered together. So this is where all those elements um, are similar. They get clustered together. Sometimes there's a part of a behavior that falls into a different cluster. If that happens a lot, you might start thinking, well, maybe that behavior is actually, should be two different behaviors. Start thinking about whether, is that behavior actually one behavior or, because the machine seems to think you can split that behavior up into two. So maybe something about um, the accelerometer trace makes the machine think that it, that it should be different. Uh, so that's this hierarchical clustering, just with these two lines here. So what I really liked about this is there are really only three or four lines that you have to run to get the data out, right? It wasn't hard at all. It wasn't like this huge R script uh, that we had to, to build all together. Uh, then we have that other data type, which was the property data type. And this is where we can look at the contribution of individual classifiers for each behavior. So we talked about this a little bit already. Uh, now we can know uh, which classifier is most useful. Uh, so here are all our um, classifiers and uh, we we'll just make some pretty colors, which gives us a whole lot of warnings. Um, and then we can produce uh, this classifier with those colors. And so here I've just defined a single classifier 13, which is SMA. Uh, yeah, here it is, 11, 12, 13. So I put 13 in here and it gives me the SMA and it gives me the heat map for the SMA. So really easy to use, um, gives us a nice um, visual way of representing our data, which I can now compare back to my plot up here and say, well, which one of these activities uh, is giving me uh, a really high score uh, and how is that affecting the rest? So, what I did finally was build a function to automate this process for us. And so this is what this function here is doing. So this function does everything we just talked about. Uh, it takes a random sample of Y um, cases. It builds the training data set, builds the testing data set, performs the um, supersom, predicts the output of it, puts it into that confusion matrix, calculates our false everythings, our sensitivity, um, combines them all into a data frame and output. So it's gonna output four rows, um, one row for each of these, um, and the number of columns, which are gonna be our behaviors. Uh, that takes a while. So you, if you really wanna do this a lot, we ended up having to do it in parallel. Parallel processing made it much, much quicker. Doing parallel processing in R is really, really easy. It's just a couple of libraries. It's this parallel library where you just use that to detect the number of cores you have. So there's one function here, detect cores, and then this do parallel library, which just registers those cores. And now it allows you to calculate things um, in parallel. So what I'm gonna do here is build some sample sizes, some different sample sizes. So I built a sequence from uh, 1,000 to 10,000 in 500, um, 500 sample um, increments. Uh, and then I'm gonna repeat that 10 times. 
So I'm going to end up with about 190 different sample sizes that I'm going to test, somewhere between 10,000 and, and 1,000. So I'm going to re do this um, um, function up here. I'm going to do that 190 times, um, but I'm going to do it in parallel using this for each function. So for each, um, i is one to length of samples. I point it to the right package, which is the Cohen, and I'm going to r bind my data at the end. Um, and then um, do par, and that's the function that I'm going to do in parallel. And you can see I get 711 seconds for 190 calculations, which comes out to about three seconds per sum, as opposed to 12 seconds per sum. So um, it really increases the speed by about a quarter of the time to do it in parallel. So it's worth doing. Some of the ones I was doing were taking hours, even in parallel. Uh, uh, so you really need to um, um, bulk up the data sets to, to get some sort of reliable estimates of, of um, how accurate these um, sums are. Okay, let's have a quick look at that output. So here's the output with sample size. And you can see a couple of things. The specificity and accuracy are actually really good, even at really, really low sample size. So here it's down to 1,000, and they're still close to one. So they're doing good almost all the time. Um, where we lose it is in the sensitivity and precision. So this is our ability to detect when things aren't there. So it seems to want to detect things um, that aren't there. So it, uh, it misclassifies it in, uh, as a false negative more often, uh, is our interpretation of this, at least at low sample sizes. And that could be because those behaviors which are poorly represented, so we don't have many samples, are less likely to get chosen in really low sample size data sets, right? So we have even fewer, so they get much, much worse. Once we get up to about 10,000, though, it starts to flatten off. So we did most of our analysis in about 20,000 sample chunks um, just to see um, some effects uh, and to, to look at our effective sample size. So that was our worst case scenario, which was galloping, right? That was the one that had the lowest prediction. If we look at walking, walking does really well, even at really low sample size. So here's the thousand, and you see we're at 99% uh, or above in all of our estimates of sensitivity. So we can almost always uh, estimate walking, even with really, really few samples. So that's good. Uh, so if your activities are really, really obvious and repeatable, then you don't need to collect a lot of training data. Like 20,000 or 2,000 samples is not a lot, right? That's, that rolling epoch, um, it's a couple of minutes of data. So that's, that's good to know. It's going to depend a lot on the behavior too. And the more variable a behavior is, the more training data you're going to need um, for that um, for the one. Okay, that's it. That's the hardest part of the SOMS data sets. So we've gotten to the point where we can now train uh, train and test our songs, and we trained it based on this accuracy precision. I'll give you all these slides so you'll, you'll have all these with all the how each of those were calculated because they're a giant pain in the ass to figure that out. <laughs> Here's our data set where we go up to a, um, a bit higher. Uh, so here we're up to um, around 100,000. And you can see it's pretty flat after 10,000. So uh, collecting too much more data, it, it doesn't seem to help anymore. At some point, you just have variability in your behavior. That's difficult um, to predict, especially for the ones like, this is the galloping one that um, was hard. And there's the output, um, which we've already talked about, which looks good. Cool. All right, any more questions about that before we move on to the last part? Nice. Okay, so this is the part uh, that I was talking about where 
I um, don't have a, a very strong um, uh, sense of where to go. And there's multiple um, ways you could go with analyzing this data. So I'm just going to give you some examples. And um, then maybe this is what we could talk about with um, what questions um, you want to answer. So um, these are just some um, of the stuff that we've done. Um, here's some work on echidnas that we did, for example. And uh, so the most simple thing you could obviously get from this data is how often do different behaviors occur? That's a really obvious one, right? Turns out, if you're looking at echidnas, they do no, not much. <laughs> you can compare that between spring and summer, and not a lot of difference. They maybe move a little bit more in spring than they do in summer, um, but there's, there's not a big um, effect on that. But that might be part of your question if you're comparing two animals. How often do they run? How often do they climb? Um, and that's maybe something that Jasmine's doing with gliders versus possums is how often are they running on the ground? And um, we want to see is this the reason that gliding is a thing because you don't have to run on the ground or something like that. So you could already get a huge amount of analyses out of this one stage. You already have your behaviors, right? So you can just say, um, you know, how often do they occur? How does that compare with other species? Are they more, are they doing vigorous activities more or less than other species? But again, we need lots of data to compare it to, which is why we're all here. Second thing you might ask is, um, how does behavior change throughout the day or the week or the season or the so on and so forth? Uh, and that's really easy to do too, because they're all time stamped, right? So now we'll have our behavior predicted for each epoch. Each epoch has a time stamp. I can just assign it an hour of the day and say, how often is this behavior, or when does this behavior occur? And we can already get this huge um, data set. We can, we can correlate that with like um, habitat variables, like how hot was the day? You know, here is a temperature um, curve um, in the sun and the shade. And we can see the kidneys are really, really sensitive to the heat, right? Because as soon as that sun comes out, they go into hiding. And in spring, it's not so bad. They'd still come out a little bit during the day. But in summer, with these really hot temperatures, these are in the shade, um, it gets up to like 30 degrees, no one's moving, no one's doing anything, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we can understand a little bit of the ecology of these animals. But uh, we might also test for a differential effect of something. Uh, and this was something that we did with the um, cat project. Here is uh, our cat talking with the bib. So we put the bib on and you can see she's already walking really, really strangely. And so the question here was, these cat bibs were shown to reduce prey catch. And the idea was, how does that work? Well, we can now use these um, SOMs to predict that because if a behavior is unaffected, then we could train our data set with the bib off and test it with the bib on. And if the accuracy is the same, then there's no effect. If the accuracy goes down, then we know that behavior is affected because the algorithm no longer works. It's changed something in its biomechanics. Uh, and so that's what we're showing here. You can compare the accuracy uh, with the bib on versus the bib off. Uh, and normally we see a little decrease, but some activities don't change much. Some decrease a lot, right? Some, uh, and the more active they are, the more they decrease. And so that tells us something about which activities are most affected by the bib. Uh, and so that's um, another way we could use uh, this machine learning algorithm as well. Um, what else have we got? We can combine it with some habitat data. And this is probably what a lot of us are really interested in. So if we had that GPS, so this is our kid now, we had a little backpack on them, uh, the UHF radio, the accelerometer, and we had a GPS in there too. So now we have where they are. 
So we talked about the trouble with GPS is that it's pretty low frequency most of the time and it's pretty inaccurate. So you can just get a sort of broad estimate of where, they're, where they are, but you can't get much behavior. With the accelerometer, we can get behavior and plot that onto that GPS location because the GPS also has a plot. So we can say, okay, what time was it in this spot and what behavior was it doing there? And now we can say, we we're looking at these echidnas and seeing, do they have an uh, area where they like to forage? Do they like walk to an area and then they dig there and like look around for stuff and then walk to another area? Turns out they didn't, they just walk and dig and walk and dig and walk and dig. Um, that's fine, but now we know that, right? Uh, so this is our echidnas. Um, the GPS data was really noisy. So above uh, is the uh, raw GPS data, and then I ran a smoothing algorithm onto that. So that's the trouble with GPS data is the faster your animal is moving, the more accurate it is, the slower your animal is moving. The more you get these random points, we call them stars. And if you just sit a GPS on the ground, you'll get like a weird star shape um, with all the noise. So we try to get rid of that as much as possible um, and overlay our behavior onto that. And because you have GPS, you can also overlay that onto some habitat. So you not only know what time of day and where it is when it forms a behavior, but what's the habitat. So it gives your um, behavior some sort of context now uh, that you can put it in. And that might be really, really interesting, I think, uh, for a lot of study. Then we get into this weird ecological biomechanic. Uh, and you notice uh, this echidna is a really good example. This is walking slowly, and then it stops, and then it sprints. This is an echidna flat out <laughs> running. I mean, you can see the difference here, right? This is a slow walk, this is the run. I mean, visually, you can inspect that uh, and know uh, the echidna is moving at two different speeds. But because you can see this on the accelerometer trace, you can pick that data out. So you can use the machine learning to say, give me all walking or running traces, and then analyze those walking or running traces further. And you can analyze them to give you frequency, and the frequency will actually tell you something about its speed. And so that's why we did that biomechanics analysis where we combine something like stride frequency with speed or stride length with speed. So we could actually work out how fast and how far they were moving. And we can actually estimate this even without a GPS, we can figure out what distances uh, animals are actually moving. Uh, and so that's something um, that we've started putting in to our little um, MATLAB script here. So I might see if that's going to work. Yeah. So I'm going to select the start time, which was back to this. So I'm going to select the start time that's about here. And an end time. Let's start. Yeah. Oh, maybe a bit less. No, it's there. Okay. So I selected my start and end time, and I've got this run. Uh, and so now we can just do a Fourier analysis, which is where we extract the dominant frequency from that. Uh, and that's what this analyze stride button does. And it poops out a whole pile of graphs, which we. Um, uh, we'll look at in a second. Zoom will let me go back down there. Uh, so we'll look at all these other graphs in a second. But this is this dominant frequency one. So here is the frequencies uh, that it's putting out. And we can see this dominant frequency is around here. And MATLAB is actually um, reading it out here. Uh, the dominant stride frequency is about three hertz. So now I know how fast it was running at that point. If I can, uh, if I do some biomechanical analysis and correlate stride frequency with speed, I can now predict how fast it was actually moving at that point in time within some sort of statistical accuracy, right? Because they're still doing some sort of um, linear regression at this point. 
And that's what we did in our echidnas. Um, and we, we got stride frequency and speed. And I tried to predict speed um, and distance moved from that data. But I also had GPS on them. So I could actually get speed and distance from my GPS data as well. And I compared the two. Uh, and that's what we're seeing in this graph here. Uh, so I was interested in, um, you know, um, how, how similar they are and how um, accurate my accelerometer estimates were. And it turns out there's, there's advantages and disadvantages to both. Because the GPS only samples at a set frequency at set times, it's always going to underestimate the speed. And the speeds are here are quite low. And the reason it, that is it includes the time that it's not moving, right? So if our echidna is just sitting still, um, then it walks for a bit and then sits still. And between those two fixes, it's moved some set distance over some set time, and we have to get the average speed. And that average speed is going to include the time it's sitting still. But look, when we use our accelerometer data, we get more realistic speeds. So we get to know about how, how fast our echidna is moving and at what times of day is it moving at top speed versus low speed. We can also use that because we know um, how um, stride frequency relates to stride length. We can work out exactly how far it's moving. Now, GPSs are really good for working out how far it's moving. And you can see these two are quite accurate. Um, they represent each other quite well. So we can use this accelerometer to estimate how far our um, echidna is moving as well as we can even without um, a GPS. Uh, so if we don't have access to the GPS, then we can do uh, a little bit more of that. We do get a bit more noise. So um, the trouble with GPS is you'll never get zero distance move because of those, those noisy spikes, right? You're always going to get some um, movement. Not true of our accelerometers, where we get zeros because it doesn't move um, in those points. Uh, so that's another way we can start to work out what our animal is doing. We now know how fast and how far it's moving. Um, we can get that from accelerometer data as well. Uh, Turning radius. So this is something we want to work on. We haven't done it yet. It might be possible with accelerometers. It might be possible if we get the ones with gyros uh, and we collect enough training data. We don't know yet. Uh, so we'll be super interested in figuring out whether that's true or not. Because running and turning uh, would be super fascinating to know uh, what animals are actually doing and, and how, how often they're doing that in the wild. Finally, there's dead reckoning. Now, before we were relying a lot on statistics um, based on our biomechanics data set, uh, but you can get, like we said before, actual estimates. So if you have acceleration, you integrate it, you get velocity. If you have velocity, you integrate it, you should get position. And we should get position really, really accurate. The trouble is that clock that we talked about, right? This is based on integration over time. But if the clock varies, then we're going to get noise creeping into our data. And that's going to be made so much worse every time we integrate with this. So we end up with really wild data that's all over the place, which is a little bit annoying. Um, so um, this bit requires a little bit more massaging. You have to do a lot more smoothing if you want to do this. Um, and most of the papers I've read, they combine all these three together. So they combine their accelerometer, the gyro, and the magnetometer. I don't see many papers trying this um, with just the accelerometer on its own, um, but that's what I'm trying to do at the moment, uh, and it's, it's going so-so. Uh, the other thing that they do is they combine it with GPS, uh, and this is really neat. So that's what this Wilson paper did. Um, so they had these collars on these cheetahs, and the collars were super smart, high tech. And they would, um, uh, they had a little solar panel so they could get some batteries, but they, there wasn't a lot of batteries on board. So they couldn't afford 
to have the accelerometer running all the time at a high frequency and the GPS running all the time. So they did some neat stuff. They would have the accelerometer running at a fairly low sample rate until it picked up the um, cheetah actually started to do an activity. And that would be the switch to turn on the sampling at a higher frequency, right? And it would also turn on the super stecky GPS that they have. Now this GPS is high accuracy and GPS has already worked pretty well when uh, animals moving quickly. So they were able to output um, this. This is their IMU. So they get their strides out of their IMU as well. So this is a cheetah um, accelerometer trace. And they also got um, their GPS velocity. So they could get velocity of the cheetah from the GPS. Now they did one more step. Remember how I said these accelerometers drift over time, right? Because they had an accurate GPS, they could use that to constrain the two ends of their accelerometer trace. Because they constrain the two ends, they know the start time and the end time, and they know the position of those two. They are now integrating over a very short period of time where they know the bounding two ends, and that allows them to integrate that accelerometer trace really, really accurately and get position back. Now, the advantage of doing that is they only have GPS fixes every bloop, bloop, bloop. They can use the accelerometers to fill in the gaps in between. So now you have precision with really, really high um, accuracy on where your animal is and how fast it's moving. And so that's where they get this trace. This is where they combine the GPS and the IMU together. We don't know how to do, I don't know how to do that yet. And the Wilson group aren't very nice at sharing their anything. Um, so <laughs> if you're interested in that, I'd love to, to try and figure out how to do that. But you'd also need to be able to um, synchronize the clocks on your GPU and IMU. Um, so having a one where they're, they're integrated together might be super useful for that. And there's a lot of maths and smoothing that goes on in there as well. But uh, here's our attempt at doing it. So that's what we saw before, uh, those other plots that come up. Uh, so here is um, our accelerometer trace. Um, and this is our combined, just um, at a first part, all the accelerometer, all the accelerometer trace from three axes. And I've smoothed it, which is the red line. Uh, then I integrated that with respect to time and got velocity. So here's our velocity over time. And you can see it, it goes positive and negative as the animal uh, is moving forwards and back. There's still a lot of noise in this though, uh, and I'm not sure how much is true. And then we have our displacement over time, uh, and it's moving in one direction, which is kind of nice, but I would expect that is to see this sort of uniform displacement like you saw in the other figure. But we can add all that up and compare it to the video data. Uh, and in that case, we knew how far the dog had traveled. Uh, and we can get it to output um, some estimate of displacement over some period of time. And so this is in meters, and it seems to be close, um, but not super accurate yet. So that's what we're currently working on, is, is getting that um, to be more and more accurate. Uh, and testing, where we have the video data, we know exactly how far our animal moved, and then trying to get our IMU to output that same distance so we can um, get really close estimates of distance moved. But that's it. That's all I've got. That's the entire workflow that we have so far in two and a half hours. So, questions, thoughts, anyone? Uh, because I didn't want to miss out on any, um, any activities, and I also didn't want 
to have to analyze each file individually. So this way I could stack all my files into one big Uber file, right? And so I would have a walking chunk and then a running chunk and then a sitting chunk, for example, one after the other. And if I just did 50 hertz chunks, I might actually um, uh, miss um, some activities or it could like lie right at the border. But with the rolling epoch, I'm certain of like, if there's an activity that's very short in duration, then it's gonna lie at some point in the center. And because those short duration activities may only have like 50 frames or something like that, then the rolling epoch will pick it up. But a chunked epoch, it might always get hidden by some other data that's, that's in there. That was that. It also increases the number of data points. Yeah. On that, same idea, would the rolling epoch accidentally, would, would it cause some of the bleed that we're getting in these weeks behaviors? Like a little bit, like if you've switched walking beside it could, yeah. So what we could do to fix that is add in um, a clause in the um, in the code. If you're worried about that, uh, you would edit the the code here where it's which max, and then you could just have some logic that says it has to be more than the next activity by at least some amount. Um, that way, if if say like one activity was 26 and the other one was 24, mm -hmm. it's too even between two different activities, right? So you might just exclude that epoch altogether. Yeah. Uh, so that, that could be something that you could do to improve the data as well. Yes, it will. It will assign something to every behavior. Whichever one is the max. There's a whole pile of like everything gets assigned behavior zero to begin with, which is an unknown behavior. So it could be assigned a zero, um, but then they just get deleted straight away when we go into the analysis. So that's what you could do if, if this is not um, greater than the other behavior by at least a lot, then just assign it zero and then remove all the zeros later. Doable, not doable. So the weakest part is now that MATLAB code, which is still full of bugs and horrible to use. Um, but the R code seems to work really well. It's just it's no like good software that allows you to combine accelerometer traces and video data right now. How much training data? So like you've got video in total, is it 10 minutes, is it 10 hours of watching an animal? Yeah, that's what we're trying to figure out with that sample size analysis, right? And it depends on the behavior. So that's what we were showing with the walking, for example. You only need a real small amount of training data, 20,000 rolling epoch or 2,000 rolling epoch. Uh, yeah, second. So not much at all, right? Um, but with the galloping, we never had enough, right? So we only had, we had 517 epochs. So it's somewhere between those two. And you saw in that graph when it really starts getting problematic. Uh, around 20, yeah. So anything less than a thousand. It's starting to get really, really. Uh, that's a thousand for twelve behaviors, though. Um, that's when our accuracy and precision really starts to drop off. Yeah, how much does that matter? In a dream world, you'd have two bandicoots and collect training data on them, and then be able to use the same training data on twenty bandicoots, not have to collect it. Yeah. How do you have a sense of you know how much variation? Would be if the animal was like that. Yeah, we tried to test that with our cat data, and we had one cat 
and we tried to kind of predict the other cats and it was pretty good. It was like the, you'd get pretty high accuracies. But we had that in the journal and the journal hated it. So we got rid of it. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah exactly. Oh, yeah, well, they said well, it's only one. So you have to test it like every individual on the rest type thing, I guess, which is, yeah, painful. Yeah. It's like, it's another for loop on top of all these for loops, which is, yeah. But you could, you could test that. Um, but you, you might, you might then end up in, um, it's in the position to what we did with the bib on and bib off data set. You could be like, how is it if I train my data set with everything except Bandicoot 1? compared to the total. And you can see what is the effect of, of dropping Bandicoot 1 from the training data set, or only using Bandicoot 1, for example, is the other way to do it. And you can see if there's a particular Bandicoot that causes a big drop, because um, if you did the always leave one Bandicoot out, you could then like see uh, if, if they're all okay, and then when you drop out Bandicoot 7, you get a completely different um, data set, then you know something's wrong with Bandicoot 7, right? <laughs> <laughs> or something's not wrong with them, and they're the only one who has something. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, or maybe, maybe it gets better when you yeah. exclude Bandicoot 7, because Bandicoot 7, then you might look at what you did wrong, and, you know, maybe the sock was on backwards. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine if you're not optimizing something, you'd want to count. So what, what would happen if you're optimizing? Yeah. So we found that it's always the high impact short duration ones. So it was the galloping, the jumping, and the um, swatting and the pouncing. So all the ones, and we think it's because they're a really short peak um, and there's not like a, a repeat of it. And also uh, pounce might look different depending on what it's pouncing on or for. And so that's, that's a problem. Is there any way to, like you, there's a like temporal correlation going on, right? Like where it might be more likely that the short duration one will be more Yeah. I mean, you could do it because you have the timestamps of all of these, right? So you could have, uh, um, I mean, you could do it statistically. So if you want to say, what's the likelihood of behavior A following behavior B, for example, that would be easy. But then using the information a priori to train the data set would be hard. Does that make sense? Because you, you wouldn't, yeah. There'd be nowhere to input that train into the network. You could go to the exercise where I think it's a big peak. I hope it's the one that we did that. But you can kind of see if you do the where jumping is. It is this one. And it's close to. It's close to sitting. fighting and it's close it's right to bouncing. Sitting. And it's right upside sitting, like sitting's just one of the selected. And you think about where how a cat yeah. jumps, it'll sit down. So it's, and yeah, so there's probably some confusion. And that might be, there's another um, thing you could vary is the size of the rolling epoch. So we chose one second arbitrarily because it's one second, right? And we also thought, what's the duration of the shortest behavior? And we wanted to make sure to capture that completely. But we didn't want to make it longer, like we didn't want to make an epoch 10 seconds, because then something like a jump, which is very short, would, would be never, never get categorized, right? And we didn't want to make it too short, because if you had a behavior that 
took a second, you would never see the complete signal of the jump. So the size of that rolling epoch is probably really important. And you could do a sensitivity analysis on that as well. You could vary the size of your rolling epoch to by like, you know, 40 samples or 45 samples or 50 samples or 60 samples or 77 and just compare um, that and you might, might find that different animals have different optimal epoch lengths. You got any questions, Lauren? I guess just um, when you did your sample size of analysis, did you uh, keep the same proportions? So galloping was a really small amount compared to the rest still? Or did you just like artificially reduce the, the amount of walking? Say that again. So with the sample size testing, did you sort of equalize all the proportions of the activities? Yeah, we didn't, no. So it was just randomly chosen. Mm -hmm. um, something else you could do is always make sure you sample evenly from each mm -hmm. activity, uh, which might, might also uh, improve the accuracy as well. And it might make it so um, you don't get the same number of, or you get really similar numbers of these um, cells. Uh, um, what do we call them again? The elements. Uh, yeah, because I think the reason that we have some that get more elements is because there's more samples of those. Yeah. So that's definitely something uh, that we could try and it would also improve it probably. Sit down and actually figure it out. And still lots to learn about this technique. Cool. All right, I can make uh, the presentation and the code available to anyone that wants it. Pretty easy. Uh, but that's about it. That's like the introduction. And so I think just knowing the pipeline allows if you ever want to collect this data, you know what steps you have to take and you know what's coming uh, on anything. And then get to the end and realize you didn't collect the needed, which was the point of workshop mostly. Cool. Awesome. I'm gonna. Who's hungry? Lunch? All right, Lauren. Are you happy with that? Yeah, it was very interesting. Thank you. Uh, I think we're all gonna sign up for lunch now. Alrighty then. Uh, we'll chat soon though. Yeah. Cool. I've got to figure out how to stop it recording. Was it? Okay. Yeah, okay. All right, Lauren, see you around. See you, bye.